with go eat popcorn. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Uh, so if you hit one of the Philippians or Colossians, you went too far back up. Galatians, keep going. But we're going to talk about anger today. We're going to talk about how do I handle anger in a Christian way? How do we handle anger in a Christian way? And worldly advice says, don't get mad, get even. Don't get mad, get even. And who, who knows what these are? These are scratch-off tickets. And you probably haven't seen too many lotto tickets in church. But we are uh, at the Gentry family Christmas. We do a gift exchange. And it's one of those games where, where you can open a present or you can steal a present. And one year, uh, this has been, this has been uh, several, several years ago. My nephew was about 10 years old. And he had a, he had opened a drone, just a little drone. It's like a $20 limit. And he wanted that drone. And in that round, that drone was stolen. And so what does this 10 year old, I, I don't know if this was a plan or if he just like, I, I don't know if he's just naturally just like thinking through things, you know, like that, that meme where all the math equations are going, but or if this was just like a 10 year old who thought, mm, lot of tickets, but he goes after the $20 worth of scratch offs as a 10 year old. And it just cracked all of us up. You know, just the most funny thing. He calmly gets up and just goes for those scratch off tickets. And it was just so funny because I, in my mind, I'm thinking this kid's a genius. The lady who had the scratch offs was definitely wanting the scratch-offs. So the next round comes around and, and she steals back the scratch-offs and he steals back the drone and he got exactly what he wanted. He didn't get mad. He didn't like sh openly show his frustration, even though a 10 year old, you know, typically when something gets taken away from a 10 year old, you know, it's like, oh, we don't, you know, no, don't take my, you know, just real calm. And the world says, right, revenge is a dish best served cold. Now, as Christians, we're not called to get even. We're not called to get revenge. But we are called to go through this life with skill, with wisdom. Matthew 10, 16, I think, is, is probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I use it a lot. It says, Behold, I am sending you... I don't have it on the slide, so don't worry about it. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be wise as serpents, cunning as serpents, clever as serpents, depending on the translation you read, but be innocent as doves. Because you see the world, there are definitely wolves in the world. There are men and women who know how to trap you. There are men and women who know how to take advantage of you. There are people who will use their frustration and their anger to destroy you. And we are called to turn the other cheek. And we're called to go the extra mile. And we're called to, if someone asks for your, your cloak, give them your tunic as well. Don't just give them your coat. Give them your shirt. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus also says to be wise as serpents. So that way people aren't just taking advantage of our kindness. So that way people aren't just constantly using us to their own end. And this is why anger is a God-given emotion. Because we need to get angry. We need to get angry because our first point, anger is extremely motivating. 
Anger is extremely motivating. I'm a soft-spoken guy. I project because we're in this loud room, or this large room. But I don't typically yell. I don't typically throw a punch. I don't typically, you know, start throwing things. But man, whenever me and Case, when we were young, I was still soft-spoken. I was still an introvert. But we would just, we would roll around on the floor with just, just kicking and punching. And one time I threw a spoon at him and it just landed perfectly. And he had this indent of a spoon, you know, just this red spoon on his chest. And, and there was another time he threw a glass candle at me. And I mean, just, we were, we were aggressive little kids. But you wouldn't think like, oh, well, you know, Josh is nice. But anger can motivate us to do things that we normally wouldn't do. And Jesus, Jesus knows that anger is a part of our lives. But we're supposed to be wise and innocent. And so we need to learn how to harness our anger to motivate us to do things that we wouldn't normally do, but to make sure we do good things. And that's why we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Because there are two spots in the Bible where it says, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Be motivated. You know, when you're angry, your heart rate goes up. Your breathing goes up, which means your body is oxygenated. It means your, your, your blood pressure rises. You want to do something. Isn't it so incredibly difficult when you're angry to not do anything? It's just like your body is screaming at you, do something. And so Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And I have heard this verse explained countless times as, well, when you're angry... Work it out. Discuss as long as you need to. And that way, whenever you go to sleep that night, you're no longer angry. But I want to tell you, we are wasting our anger. We are wasting our anger. It is so hard to do something when you feel nothing. It is so hard to get ahead if you don't feel motivated. It's so hard to change things if you feel kind of depressed. But when we are angry, our body is screaming at us to go and do something. And so I would like to, for, uh, well, I don't even have my sermon pulled up yet. You guys have just been getting me ad-libbing this whole time. I'm angry about it. If you are angry about something in the world, And it isn't just your self-centeredness that isn't being pleased. It, you can be angry because, you know, your, your wife didn't make supper for you that night and you're tired. But that's not good anger. That's really not, that's what, motivating you to disagree with your wife because you were both tired. That, where's that going to get you? But if you are really angry about something that's going on that you know is not right, we give the devil an opportunity to continue his work if we don't do something. If we don't intervene. If you, are, if you are concerned about how the school system is becoming too political. In some situations, it might be okay to pull your kids out and homeschool. But in other situations, maybe we don't give the devil an opportunity and we just get more involved in the schools. Billy was school board president. What do you think affects more change? Being a part of the school or removing yourself from the school? Maybe we get involved in the PTA. Maybe we, maybe we start going to more school functions. Maybe we start volunteering more. Maybe we be the change. 
Because there's other kids who also need to know the truth. Maybe you are tired of just, you are so frustrated because you are being disrespected and mistreated and unappreciated. If doing the same thing has gotten you where you're at, you're disrespected because maybe it's the way that you, you talk about yourself. And other people think, oh, well, they talk about themselves like that, so they must know it. Or, or unappreciated. Well, maybe, maybe you're enabling and you're overstepping and people don't know how to, to say, hey, I, I can do this for myself. You don't need to do this. And so they just treat you poorly. Maybe you're mistreated because you're allowing it to take place. And so we should be angry because we are all created in the image of God. But we also have to consider, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. The Bible says in Romans 12, don't pull it, I've got some verses from 12, but this isn't that. The Bible says, don't repay evil with evil. But instead, take your enemy and feed them if they're hungry. If your enemy is thirsty, give them water. Trust that the Lord will avenge you. But what happens whenever you start thinking deeply, when you start to grow in wisdom and you start to grow in cleverness and, and cunning like the serpent, but you are still as innocent as the dove, it changes the way people treat you. If you go the extra mile and you are still disrespected, you don't have to feel angry anymore because you know I'm doing what God tells me to do. And at some point, this is going to pay off. But if you sit there and you can't just continue to be disrespected and you continue to do the same thing, and you just think to yourself, man, I just, ugh, it, it grinds my gears how they treat me. And you never do anything different. You will always be stuck in the same situation. Nothing will change. If you have witnessed something that has made you angry, and God is laying it on your heart to do something about it, and you do nothing about it, is that giving God an opportunity? Or is that giving the devil an opportunity? I tell you, there, something that just weighs so heavily on my heart, and I still haven't done anything about it, is the sex trade. Whenever I was in college, I, I knew of a, an organization that would help women be pulled out of the sex trade. And they would house them, and they would, you know, it was, it was a transitionary house where they would send them someplace else after they got stable. And that is something that breaks my heart. And it makes me so angry to hear that people could be treated that way. And something so, something that has so much vulnerability tied to it. And so what needs to happen in my life is that I need to take consideration and I need to consider what can I do? That's my next step. What can I do? And whatever it is on your heart that God is saying, how can you be a part of the change? We have to consider it. Otherwise, this anger just continues to build and, and turns into something that isn't healthy. Because this is what happens to us, our second point, you become what you tolerate. You become what you tolerate. If you tolerate just this low-grade frustration in your life all of the time, what happens to you? You become frustrated. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life, you become bitter. You become resentful. If you know that there's a change that needs to take place and you are always putting it off, you become anxious. 
whenever you feel like there is no more hope left because you, you feel like the action is too big, what happens? You become depressed. And because we are tolerating things that we should not tolerate, Who's the one who pays? Ourselves and everybody around us. Who has to deal with me most? The people I work with and my spouse. They are paying because I'm tolerating. Who's really paying because I'm tolerating? Isn't it God? God is laying it on your heart to do something. He is giving you the energy to do something. Oh, man. Sometimes I wish I just could get angry. Like I could just turn it on because I know that whenever I am angry, I do something about it. Don't take those moments for granted. Don't take those moments as just like, oh, well, I need to get rid of my anger. You need to get rid of the source. And the source isn't just, oh, well, they treat me. You know, they say these things and it gets under my skin or, you know, she chews too loud and he farts in bed. <laughs> You don't get a, you don't you know you don't get rid of that. <laughs> you don't get rid of your pastor because he says a certain F word that you don't like. <laughs> Not the other F word. <laughs> you address the source. You address the source. What needs to change? Because usually what happens when we get angry is we let this anger build up inside of ourselves and then we just explode on the closest person. It doesn't matter if they're a part of it or not, they're getting the force of it. We turn into little ticking time bombs. And eventually, probably the person we love, who we know we can get away with it, has got to experience the explosion. But this is what the other place in the Bible says about being angry and not sinning. Be angry. This is Psalm 4, 4, 4 through 5, and then verse 8 as well. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts. Ponder means to weigh out different options. Ponder on it. Consider, if I do this, how will they react? If I do this other thing, what trajectory will that take my family down? What trajectory will that take my work life down? Ponder in your hearts on your own beds. Be silent. Don't say anything. Don't talk about it. Now, I'm not saying like stuff your emotions and don't trust people. Don't argue for a moment. Don't, don't, don't get into a fit all of a sudden. Just continue to, to weigh out the options. Before you speak, think. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. But we're going to get back to that. In peace I will lay down. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Mariah and I watched this uh, competition reality show. I talked about it in a different sense on, uh, in Sunday school, but we, we saw this lady and something happened and she was angry about it. And it's like a 24 hour deal. And she was up all night and she's like, oh, I can't believe that guy did that. And I can't believe he, I got to take the power back and all this stuff. And she's just laying in bed and her arms are flailing around. Cause she's just like, she's still irate about it. And she get she, and you hear her say, that's what I'll do. I'll put him in his place. And it was crazy. So the next morning she marches down and, and she addresses the whole house and she looks like a total buffoon. It was hard to watch. Whew. This lady just going off and the guy had no idea what he even done. It was embarrassing. But she thought she had to be the one who makes this right. She was going to take her power back. And instead, we're called to lie down and sleep because we have the peace that says, whenever I'm angry and I'm bringing it to God, if I trust God and follow through on what he says, he will help me dwell in safety. He will bring about the change. But this offer right sacrifices, 
Ponder in your hearts. Be silent. Offer right sacrifices. This is where we're going to look at Romans 12. I want you to go ahead and turn to Romans 12 because it's so important. Romans, it comes after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there's Acts, and it's the first of Paul's letters. It's the longest of Paul's letters. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The songs that we sing, they aren't worship. The lyrics and the music and all that, that's not worship. You are the worship. The one who is doing something, who is the one who is singing, the one who is presenting their body, is the worship. The way you perform your jobs is your worship. The way you parent is your worship. What are you worshiping? The way you interact with your friends is worship of something. We are just drawn to worship. That's why we love celebrities. Because it's an idol. It's something we can follow. And when we follow in somebody's footsteps, whether it's Taylor Swift or, or Brad Pitt or, or whoever our heroes are, we're worshiping them. Because we are presenting our bodies as, as a testimony to our love. And so whenever he says, ponder in your hearts what you're going to do with your anger and make right sacrifices, what are you actually going to do? Don't just bring a goat to church because I might love it too much. I, I, I might just want to pet it. You know, that's not a good sacrifice. You are a living sacrifice. Will you sacrifice your time? Will you sacrifice your energy? Will you sacrifice your comfort to go and be a change? To be a change maker? To commit to something greater than yourself? To commit to changing the community that you find yourself in, that you are frustrated with? Because words aren't enough. We can talk about change all the time. But unless somebody actually does something and takes the right action, nothing happens. That's our third point. Don't argue, take action. And the more wisdom you can possess, wisdom, the word for wisdom is skill. The more skilled at life you are, the better action you can take. Now, Michelangelo, not the, not the Ninja Turtle, there was a statue, there was a, there was a marble column in this, this cathedral. It probably cost a gazillion dollars. You know, if you do the trans, you know, with inflation. Probably about an eight foot tall column of solid marble. And a, a sculptor was supposed to, to create this, this statue. But they had drilled a hole in the marble. And guess what? They drilled this hole in the wrong spot. Before anything had been carved, they ruined this massive piece of marble. For years, it just collects dust. It collects cobwebs. Nobody knows what to do with it because it's ruined. It was, it was just in the absolute wrong spot. Michelangelo comes and he thinks about, well, that's where the hole is. This is after years. He says to himself, well, maybe I can just alter the design a little bit. And so this wasted piece of marble becomes the famous 
statue of David. Okay? Do we all know the famous statue of David? Massive thing. I think it, he just ends up shifting the placement of the leg a little bit. That's all it took. But this guy had the audacity after Michelangelo salvaged this giant piece of marble. That's not the travesty. The travesty is this guy walks in and Michelangelo is, is I don't know, let's just say he's sculpting a calf, okay? His calf. And the guy walks in and he says, rich, 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 rich dude. Don't you think the nose looks a little big? And Michelangelo knows that the nose isn't too big. He, he knows it. He knows that the nose is not too big. And he, he, he stands next to this patron and he says, hmm, you know, you might be right. Let's, let me take you up to this, this other place and I'll, I'll change the nose a little bit and see what you think. And he brings him up on the scaffolding which he knows is the intended direction that this statue is supposed to be seen. And he grabs a little bit of marble dust and he grabs his chisel and he goes up there and he acts like he changes the nose and he sprinkles a little bit of dust as he does it so that way there's evidence that he changed it, okay? And he, he stands back from the statue and he says, how does that look? And this rich guy is like, oh, so much better. Michelangelo didn't argue. He didn't try to convince him that he was right, but he changed the perspective. And he took some action. Nobody had to get angry. Nobody had to have their feelings hurt. And the statue is now probably one of the most famous statues of history. And I'm not saying be deceptive. I'm saying be wise. Don't argue. Consider what the right sacrifice is. Consider the right choice. Consider the right method. Consider the right mode. Be innocent as doves. There isn't black and white in this world. There are a lot of shades of gray. And we have to make sure that what we are doing is as close to God's will as we can possibly understand at the moment. The problem is, we just, we blow it when we try to argue. When we try to argue, when we try to convince, when Jesus goes into the temple, this is Jesus' last week before he's crucified on the cross. He goes into the temple, and we all know what he does, right? He flips the tables. The money changers' tables where they're taking advantage of people, he flips them. And he, it says he, he grabs some cord and makes a whip and drives people out of the temple. Now, Jesus knew what he was doing, and he didn't wait around. He didn't discuss with the priests, well, don't you think that the money changers are a little bit much? You know, they're charging 25 cents for a 10-cent dove, you know? No, he just says, something has to be done, and he does it. But years have gone by where he goes into this temple. He knows what he's doing. He knows that this is one more action that the Pharisees and the Sadducees will hate him for, so that way they crucify him on the cross. He is thinking through and strategically doing what he needs to do to accomplish God's will. And that's what we are called to do in our own lives. We are called to follow the example of Christ. This is why I started the church here. Because for a decade and a half, I was frustrated and disappointed with the way the church was, way, with the way many churches, I won't say the capital C church, there are good churches out there, but with many churches, how they ignore new Christians and they fail to train new leaders. 
And so what happens typically in a church is you get somebody in a position and that's who's going to be in the position until they get so fed up that they quit. You suck them dry and then you just send them on their way. Church is supposed to be something different. Church is supposed to be the place where your cup is filled so that way you can go and be the change that you need to be during the week. And I wanted, I so wanted to not to have to start the church at, what, 29, 28? Mariah doesn't remember. She's not good at numbers. I don't have time to do math. She's great at accounting, I will say. But we looked and looked for a church that would pour into us. Not in a selfish way, but, but in a way that was like, we want to be, be useful. Is there a, a, an inviting, a friendly church that cares about raising up people? And we went to many churches and they all seemed full or they all seemed like, well, we've already, we've got what we need. We're not really wanting to change things. And so I don't want to sit back. This is why this place exists. For one reason why this place exists. But I wasn't going to wait and sit back for that church to pop up someplace else. I don't want for other people to have to feel the way that I felt for too long. And it's not because God, you know, I was alone and, and God gave me this vision. No, I got to experience a great church that did this. And I was mentored for three years on a weekly basis by the pastor. And it changed my life. And I didn't want to sit back and wait for somebody to eventually do that and then I could tag along. I wanted to be somebody who makes that happen for somebody else. And I was frustrated by it not taking place. I won't stand for the church to ignore the difficult and messy work of getting involved in people's lives so that way they can see the change that God can create. Now we'll get to Romans 12 again. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is what continues to motivate me, is knowing that when you offer right sacrifices, you can trust that God will give you a harvest of righteousness. I just keep thinking. The, the last couple weeks have been, have been challenging to get everything done. And I have lost sleep in order to get everything done. But I just keep thinking. Jesus changed the world with 12 men. Changed the entire world. With 12 men who loved him immensely. And we have, on average, 60 people here five times as many. That means we can go to Mars and Venus and Mercury and uh, we can't go to Jupiter because it's, it's, it's a gas ball, guys. It's really dangerous there. Bad part of town. We ought to be able to change five Earths. But we can't just sit back and wait for somebody to change it. We cannot repay evil for evil. We can't repay evil with being passive because we're just allowing evil. What we have to do is we have to give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. It's honorable if you see something that needs to change to change it. It's honorable to serve Christ when it's difficult. Do not be overcome by evil. It's not going to win unless you let it win. Overcome the evil by doing good. Do good. The Great Commission. Therefore, go into the world. 
make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all of my commandments. Everything in that sentence is a verb. I mean, there's other words, but every important word is a verb. And the first one is go. Go. Make disciples. Go into the world. Go teach. This is our last point today. Number four. Don't run from the pain. Run to the solution. Don't run from the pain. Run to the solution. Mariah hates Tylenol. All right? She hates Tylenol. All it does is hide the pain. It doesn't address, address the solution. What's the source of the pain? And sometimes I just say, take the Tylenol. <laughs> but <laughs> in a spiritual sense, we don't run from the pain of our spiritual lives. You can't run from the pain in your spiritual life. You reap what you sow. It isn't like a, a, a headache. A headache will, will eventually go away. It isn't like a cut. A cut will be healed on its own. Now, I mean, we could get into infection, but anyway. Spiritually, your spiritual wounds, the spiritual wounds in this world, they don't just go away. And as we continue to run from hurting people, the world will continue to be hurt and hurt and hurt more and more and more. There is one animal, one animal. All animals try to flee from a storm. You know, you, you see them taking cover, the cats hide under the porch and, and the dogs go into the corner and, and everything hides during a storm, except for the American bison. The American bison, they, you know, they're on the plains and they can see a, a storm coming for miles. And what does the bison do? It sees a storm and it runs into it. It runs into the storm. And guess what? A bison will get more wet than a, a raccoon. But that storm will last a much shorter time because you have two bodies moving in, in the opposite direction. If you constantly are running from the storm, it will constantly be following you. You will eventually get wet. But if you run into the storm of your life and you have Christ by your side, you will come out on the other side different but better. And the world will become different and better because of you and because of Christ. This is our right offering. Run into the storm. Run to the solution. If you cannot tolerate sin taking all of the opportunities that God has for you away, the time is to run to Him. And if you see something in your life that is oh, it's just so much frustration, Stop running and seeing how you can avoid it. Run towards it and see how God can solve it. Because this is what he has done for us already. He didn't wait in heaven for everything to be right on its own. He ran into the storm that is this life and gave his entire life to free you from sin, to free the world from sin. Let's go ahead and stand. If you can't tolerate it anymore, don't. Like Levi said, come talk to me, come talk to him, come talk to Billy, Mariah. We want to be there to support you. Whether you are giving your life to Christ or you are ready to, to change lives for Christ. Let's do it together. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much that you have changed our destinies. You have changed our lives. You have changed this world. God, I pray that you will 
Help us to look deeply into our emotions and see how you are wanting to shape our actions. Help us to not tolerate sin any longer. Help us to stop arguing and wasting time and sitting by. God, help us to act. Help us to do. Help us to win. Today, I, give you, I pray that you give the courage to all those who are feeling your divine discontentedness, your holy anger, that they won't waste another day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.